In the spring of 1995, Epsilon Gamma was featured as the cover story of the Beta Theta Pi magazine. The article, written by magazine editor Herb Johnson, Idaho 53, focused on the daily life of the Epsilon Gamma chapter, including its triumphs and its challenges. Later that year, with coordination by Ed Smith, more than 200 Beta brothers and friends gathered at the Comfort Inn in Mount Pleasant for the Diamond Anniversary Banquet, celebrating the chapter's 10th year at CMU. The chapter won Sisson Awards in 1994, 1995, 1996, 1997, 1998, and 1999. I remember the sports, I remember the, the camaraderie, I remember just the overall enthusiasm that all of us had about everything that we did. I remember the friendships, uh, the intramural sports, uh, just because that was something that I took a great interest in. I remember Beta teaching me to you know, become the person who I am today. Um, it definitely brought me out of my shell and I am very grateful to Beta for that. Epsilon Gamma was recognized for its academic achievements with the General Fraternity's Virginia Tech Award for highest GPA in its region. 1996 through 1998. In November 1999, under the chairmanship of Chris Makowski, the Epsilon Gamma Alumni Association recognized that in a few short years, Epsilon Gamma would own the chapter house. Looking ahead, the question was posed, what should we do next? It was Chris Makowski, who is the Alumni Association president, who asked Ken Breen, one of our great beta brothers, to review the best practices of the fraternity system, uh, to review what the wants and needs were of our alums and undergraduates, of parents, and really come up with a strategic direction that we could follow basically for the next 20 years. Breen spent 11 months gathering information and processing the information into a summary report. All in all, he just spent pretty close to a year just assembling just an, an ungodly amount of data. What started out as a simple bricks and mortar initiative evolved into something far more dynamic. The further Epsilon Gamma got into this project, the more it became clear that a fraternity house must be built on a firm foundation, and the foundation had nothing to do with bricks and mortar. Rather, a firm foundation had everything to do with having clearly defined goals for the Epsilon Gamma organization. On October 28, 2000, the strategic planning report was adopted as a roadmap for Epsilon Gamma. To really focus our attention on advising the chapter, running the corporation, and providing uh, the long-term endowments for scholarships, for leadership development activities, uh, while maintaining a relationship opportunity and, a, and an opportunity to build relationships within our alumni ranks. Based on a recommendation from the report, the Epsilon Gamma Alumni Association and the Epsilon Gamma Housing Corporation were merged into a single governing body. For two organizations that were operating simultaneously, there weren't enough bodies, there weren't enough people who could be involved and actively contribute. So what we thought we would do is combine resources, make one real strong, good group, and uh, just move forward. We have found since that we've been able to fill our board, maintain a high quality of activity for our alumni through the pig roast, through the homecoming activities, and our annual golf outing. And we're more financially sound than we've ever been. On November 11th, 2000, Epsilon Gamma alumni and guests enjoyed a fun-filled evening at the Comfort Inn in Mount Pleasant for the chapter's 15th anniversary. Founding father Tom Bussano chaired the event. But all was not right with Epsilon Gamma several warning signs of trouble began to appear. Externally, the fraternity world was changing. Fraternities changed in the 90s because they were forced to change. There was a different culture being created on college campuses where the expectation for academic achievement was higher. Uh, if something wasn't done to reverse the trends, like uh, decline in membership from 8,000 undergraduates down to 6,000 undergraduates, and some 50 plus chapters on an annual basis were experiencing risk management incidents. Only 48% of our chapters were even above the all men's average on campus. We weren't even average. If the Greek life continued as it was in the 90s, that there weren't, would not be any more fraternities or sororities on campus. And in order for the fraternity system to stay relevant, we had to change our tactics as well. Sure, we're going to focus on social activities, we're going to have a good time, we're going to develop ourselves as friends and brothers, but we're also going to develop as leaders and scholars.
In early 2002, following a risk management violation and a university investigation, the chapter was placed on probationary status through the spring of 2004. Sanctions included the prohibition of social, athletic, and recruitment activities. When you start to see multiple mistakes made without the accountability and the university begins to take notice of your organization, not for the things that at one point in time made your group uh, an outstanding chapter on campus, but you start to be recognized for violations of code and things of that nature, you really have to step back and evaluate why you have a chapter. The stipulation was added that any future violations of the student code of conduct would result in the removal of campus recognition. Beta Theta Pi would not be allowed to return to the campus in the foreseeable future. Drastic action would be necessary to preserve the long-term viability of the organization. When the university told us it would no longer tolerate stereotypical fraternity behaviors, we had to change our course of action. You're talking about making a decision for 200 plus men that had come before you that all have an opinion and an idea of what they would expect and how things should go. After exhaustive information gathering and opinion outreach to the entire chapter, the directors and advisors voted unanimously to close the chapter. It was decided that instead of trying to operate on a skeleton crew for two years of suspension from recruitment activities, athletic activities, and social activities, our only true option was to close down for two years with a return agreement with the university that would allow us to come back. It really tore me up. It, it was one of the toughest things that I had to do. And I know there were some questions about it at the time that it happened. It basically had to be done that way, otherwise we wouldn't have been successful anyway. And it wasn't easy for me because I started the chapter. I was here at the beginning and I built it up. And it wasn't an easy decision to say, hey, we need to close closed down. It was really the only decision that we could make because uh, um, I, I don't know about anybody else but um, I, wasn't, I wasn't willing to risk seeing it go away forever. The decision was announced to undergraduate members on Tuesday, March 26, 2002 in Mount Pleasant. I saw the look on Tom Over's face when he was talking to, to the undergraduates. It tore him up, it tore me up and it wasn't an easy task to do. It's a rough period. Two years, no actives, no homecomings, no activities at the house.